Have you ever looked across our society and thought to yourself, Jesus, things are a bit glum at the moment. I mean, there's so much anger, negativity, and people taking themselves way too seriously. And it just makes me think, not to sound dismissive, but I think we need a bit of a break. And to be honest, we might need to have a good old laugh at ourselves to find that common ground. I mean, look at the video game industry. This is a paradox where the business of entertaining people is taken way too seriously sometimes. But at least, some games knew when to point the finger at themselves and have a good old chuckle. Self-critique, when done with good intention, is a fantastically humbling experience and one that can actually allow us to connect with other people better. So you know what? Let's drop the tough guy act, let's lower our guards and look at some of the times that even well-respected and established franchises planted tongue firmly in their own cartridges. Because with this in mind, I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 video games that own themselves. Number 10. Sonic Mania so here's the thing, with a surprising hit movie under his belt and the brilliance that was Sonic Mania, it may seem that the blue blur has finally started to win back the mainstream audience after, let's just admit it, a very rough couple of years. It seemed for the longest time that Sega had no idea how to make a decent Sonic game and were just throwing everything at the wall to see what stuck, only for it to congeal together and slide into the bin, which they then dug back out again and used as the boss designs for Sonic Boom. And it seemed that Sonic Mania was all too familiar with these issues that the series had been having. After all, let's not forget that this was made by fans of the games itself rather than Sega, and so carried with it a sense of awareness lacking from previous titles. And there's no better example of this than when Christian Whitehead deliciously lampooned Sega in the game's second level Studioopolis. After besting the Zone's boss, which is a climate-flipping egomatic itself parodying Sonic and Knuckles' weather vane cluckoid badnik, the TV feed cuts to a test card accompanied by a rather annoying buzz. Now this, however, is no standard studio static, it is the exact same buzz which plagued Sega's 25th anniversary livestream, one that infamously was beset by technical issues. Now that is a pointed barb. Number 9. World of Warcraft now this might blow your mind, but somebody recently crunched the numbers and found out that across the six expansions of World of Warcraft, which launched in 2004, there are 15,000 side quests. That is ludicrous, right? And how many of them do you want to bet just boil down to collecting, I don't know, like 10 rare goblin ears or something utterly ludicrous like that? But to be fair, the latter day World of Warcraft quests have become a little bit more dynamic than that across the years, but back in the day they were as grindy as Tony Hawk's with a pepper mill, and even the quest planners seem to have grown tired of the contriving reasons why your little cowman should harvest 15 raptor eggs. Case in point, the mission in the Badlands which requires you to kill a malevolent golem and also to collect 10 intact elemental cores. And if you're asking yourself why you'd need such a specific item, well, the developers clearly gave up here because the description reads, you know this just because you're psychic. I can totally imagine the writer just penning this and then clocking off for lunch, laughing to themselves at how apt this one line was for so many of these early day quests. Number 8. Parodius in the mid-80s, Konami, much like the rest of the video game industry, were sick as a bucket of vomit of space shooters, having released a slew of sci-fi schmops across the past decade, from Space Invaders, Clone Space King to Gyrus, to the scrolling Scramble and its defining sequel, Gradius. As you might expect, doing the same thing over and over again made them a little loopy, and so we ended up getting things like the cute em up shooter that was Twin B, and this also led to an even more mad title with Parodius, or to give it its full title, Parodius, the Octopus Saves the Earth. As the name suggests, Parodius was a direct parody of Gradius, and instead of ships, the player commands characters from other Konami games including Goemon and Nightmare's Popolon Knight. Bosses include a Jankin hand, a ghost with a face drawn on it, and a giant penguin. Meanwhile, instead of pulsating chip tunes, each stage is scored with classical music because, well, it's just utterly nuts. Now, sadly, Parodius never left Japanese shores, though it's understandable actually because given that it is crammed full with utterly incomprehensible, untranslatable cultural references. Still though, what a strange way to make light of the current state of the market at that time. Number 7. Discworld Terry Pratchett's phenomenal Discworld series is, in short, 
pure banter. The entire concept is so tongue-in-cheek that it's poking out the bloody side of its face more often than not, and the absurd methods to solve its numerous puzzles was not lost on the audience nor its creator. The number of fourth wall breaking moments and sheer self-awareness are too numerous to put here, and the games mock the point and click genres tropes at nearly every corner. However, there's one instance that stands out as a true mirror shattering moment, and that's after you had to slog it back and forth across the disc in the first game, only to find out that you need a magical sword in order to progress. So off you go to meet a magical dwarven swordsmith, and it's here that the pointy hatted hero is gobsmacked with the smith saying that he'll tune up the sword straight away asking incredulously, aren't you gonna tell me that you won't do the task until I find some obscure item from somewhere? Which leads to the pair actively coming up with a quest to justify how easy the transaction was. Now that is meta. Number 6. The Secret of Monkey Island Ron Gilbert might have picked up the idea for The Secret of Monkey Island from the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disney World, which is actually quite funny seeing how the Pirates movies actually ended up taking their tonal inspiration from Monkey Island, but you know what, it was other adventure games, and in particular Sierra's adventure titles, from which he drew the most inspiration for its famed humour. Between the manual gleefully telling players that, unlike certain rival games, curiosity won't kill LucasArts' cats, and taking King's Quest to task, Monkey Island also found time to gently deride itself, as during the game's closing cutscene, Guybrush Threepwood and Elaine Marley are enjoying some fireworks, allowing this moment to play out. At least I learned something from all of this, he tells the prospective partner. What's that? She asks, a romantic glint in her eyes. And it's here that three dialogue choices are presented to the player, only one of which is obviously the right one. Never pay more than 20 bucks for a game. The end. Number 5. Thimbleweed Park In 2014, Ron Gilbert was up to his old tricks again and posed the question as to whether anyone wanted to fund his new old-school style point-and-click adventure. The answer was, oh hell yeah my dude! As a result, the subsequent Kickstarter campaign Thimbleweed Park came to be, a title that sold itself as being a long-lost LucasArts gem. And with years of manufactured lineage to draw on, this meant that there were so many in-jokes and a size designed to pop the fans. He'd also pop a blood vessel because of how obtuse some of the puzzles were, and how the game would mock you at every turn for getting solutions wrong. This led to the game becoming pretty inaccessible to newcomers to the genre, almost by design, and so the devs, recognizing that it was part of the problem it was parodying, later patched in both gameplay hints and, for benefit of those mouse-averse millennials, an option to turn off, and I quote, annoying in-jokes. If only we did that, eh? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Steve, don't you? <laughs> oh, impenetrable. Number 4. Banjo-Kazooie – Nuts and Bolts What's more fun than completing a jigsaw? Not much, I imagine. Am I right, fellow kids? But somehow Banjo-Kazooie made this even more exciting by asking you to find all of the pieces of the puzzle first, and they were strewn across amazing levels themed around forests, dungeons, and spools. And yet, Nuts and Bolts seemed to think that the previous way of making landmark platforming games was boring and so decided to poke fun at itself in a way that somehow only managed to invite more criticism. The game begins by breaking the hearts of item enthusiasts the world over, where we find a rotund Banjo, having let himself go through years of inactivity, forced to whip himself into shape by the Lord of Games, and is tasked with collecting as many pointless things as possible. The world is then filled with thousands of spinny gold trinkets, but before the flabby fuster can even take a step, the L.O.G. declares it tedious. Well, of course that level of overkill won't be fun for the player, but then the game tries to use this as a means to move from puzzles to car parts. It's somewhat ironic, then, that years later Playtonic, a team made up of many former Banjo staffers, released Ukulele, a collectathon de force, and people praised it for returning to its roots, despite not being as good as the old Bird and Bear team-up. Number 3. Flower, Sun and Rain Goichi Suda's Flower, Sun and Rain strangely points a finger at itself to not have a laugh about one particular aspect of its own game, but rather about how it's kind of a crap title. 
Like all of Suda51's divisive output, it is at least confident in its delivery. Now, the story revolves around our hero trying to defuse a bomb, but in a rib against nearly all adventure games, forgets what he's actually meant to be doing as he becomes buried in side quests, and he's then forced to relive the same day again and again, solving all of the problems episodically. Now, in one episode, an obnoxious kid called Shoutaro winds up the protagonist something silly, pointing out the internal flaws in the game's logic, because, for example, why is he wearing a dark suit on a Pacific island? And then he goes on to mock the title's primitive graphics, to which we basically then get what can only be described as Suda leaning into the mic himself as we hear that the reason for the graphics being less than stellar is that they are meant to be, and I quote, a unique, stylized way of representing human attributes. Right. Well, that's told us then. Number 2. Donkey Kong Country Rare's sparkling capacity for self-deprecation was in full evidence years before a portly banjo huffed and puffed in pursuit of a jumbo-sized amount of jiggies, as seen in Donkey Kong Country. Now you'd think, eager to please their new bosses, that Rare would have treated gaming's first guerrilla legacy with appropriate respect and decorum. Not in the slightest, because the OG DK was recontextualized as an onerous, faded mascot perpetually put out by the modern era's polygons and color palettes. When he's not handing out withering insults masquerading as tips, Cranky Kong rants at his successor about the parlous state of 90s video games, including cracking quips such as, I bet they wasted half the memory already on this section alone, and I've got more gameplay in my little finger than you've got in this whole game. What a strange self-burn. And number one, don't buy this. So, there's a fine art to advertising. Some games will oversell, promising the world to players but only delivering a spit of land. Others will just boast in general, and some, well, they'll try and get clever with it all. In short, few games actually ever truly deliver on their bluster, yet one ZX Spectrum title released in 1985 somehow did the impossible. Don't buy this, five of the worst games ever did exactly what it said on the tin. Well, technically, cassette inlay. Rather than bin the utterly abysmal submissions that were sent to the studio who made this, the publisher of Don't Buy This instead decided to repackage them into sort of a greatest sh** collection and flog it for £2.50. The liner notes warned that the unholy quintet disgraced the spectrum and even encouraged consumers to copy the game as well to spread it through piracy. And get this, if you were pissed off with the content, you could write to them and they'll send you a sticker. And wouldn't you know it that this set of games that were apparently so bad that the publisher discouraged people from trying to buy it turned out to be a commercial hit. Well, apparently nothing resonates with the British public quite like irony, it seems. Well, there we go. And there we go, those were 10 video games that owned themselves. I hope that you enjoyed that, my friends, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. If you want to chat to me further about video games, music, TV, wrestling, whatever, then you can do so over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. We talked about games that owned themselves, and you know what? Sometimes that can be very good, having a bit of a self-reflective moment, allowing yourself a bit of space and time to really ask yourself, are you okay? I mean, a lot of the time we can just get on through it by putting our head down and pushing forward, but you know what? Sometimes it is best to ask ourselves those types of questions because you might find that your energy is being wasted on something that you can't even control. And that's okay because with the help of friends, family, and professionals in the support industry, you might find that those problems that you were wasting a lot of energy on can be overcome in a much easier fashion. I hope that you're well and treating yourself fairly. Now go out there and smash it, you big ledge. As always, I've been Jules. You have indeed been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.